Hello EU4 players, my name is AlzboHC, and in the following video we will cover the top tips and tricks to guide your nation to greatness. Whether you are a new, returning, or intermediate player, these 10 tips and recommendations will allow you to survive and thrive, from the era of exploration to the era of mindless blobbing. Given the scope of these strategies, they will work on all patch versions of the game, past, present, and future. I invite you to sit back, relax, and consume your trade good of choice. It's time to get started with the basics. The first tips we will cover pertain to the user interface aspects of EU4. More specifically, we will take a look at the national outliner, province and nation search functions, and various notification logs you can enable in order for you to have a better idea of what is happening in the world around you. You might already be aware that the outliner can be used to view your diplomats, armies, navies, and so on and so forth, but you might not know that you can augment this interface by clicking on the top left of the screen to pull up the outliner options menu. Using this menu, you can display hidden features, like human players and a list of your national provinces. Listing human players is only really useful in multiplayer matches, but the province outliner is great as you can use it to view each of your province's cultures, religions, manpower, and tax contributions. You can also click on any of these provinces to teleport your camera to the selected area, but there is a better way to accomplish this if you're looking for a particular province or region. If you close the outliner options menu, you can find provinces more easily by pressing the F button on your keyboard. We aren't pressing F to pay respects though, since the Find Provinces UI is incredibly useful. You can type the name of any province, region, or country in this menu to instantly find the location of your query, assuming you've discovered the area already. Unless if you're a medieval geographer or historian, this feature is essential, and can be used to find just about anything you're looking for on the world map. And, since EU4 is a glorified map staring simulator, this tool will save you time and effort to find what you need. The next UI tip we will cover features a notification filter at the bottom right of your screen, locatable just above the mini-map. You can use this to filter important information regarding your nation, neighboring countries, and other world powers. Events listed include nations declaring war on each other, peace treaties and their terms, alliance acceptance offers, and more, so this interface is highly useful to gauge the political situation of the world around you. You can customize this feature even further by using filterable settings, accessible on the rightmost tab of the interface. Using this, you can individually select the nations you are interested in hearing information about. You can also choose predefined filters, such as geographical areas, neighbors, or friends and allies. The last UI tip I want to cover is the notification log. Although unknown to many players, the log can be used as a supplement to the notification filter. More specifically, the log can show event, trade, government, diplomatic, and military messages, which go further in depth than the aforementioned notification filter. This interface is also customizable, but you might want to leave it hidden as the information presented is really, really dense. If you'd like to play the game at a snail's pace or enjoy taking your time though, it can be useful to have. The next essential tip we will cover is a basic overview of the personal union mechanic. In brief, personal unions are incredibly powerful, effectively allowing you to become the overlord of nations of any size, including massive countries like Russia, either diplomatically or through war. Available to Christian rulers of any denomination, PUs can be tricky to obtain, but it doesn't have to be that way. On the top left of your screen, you will often find a shadowy icon with a crown on their head. By clicking this icon, the disputed succession interface will open, displaying countries that currently lack heirs. If you want to improve your chances of obtaining a personal union, you should send out royal marriages to these nations, with preference given to nations with old rulers and lower prestige than yourself. If you marry these countries and have a higher development than any of the other nations who have royal marriages with them, you will have a chance to PU them if their ruler dies without an heir. The exact formula for this process is incredibly complicated, but you can check to see if you will PU a nation by clicking on their flag and hovering over their current ruler. On the bottom of this tab, you will find the On Monarch Death interface, which shows who will inherit the nation on the monarch's death. Chances are high that a noble from your house will ascend to the throne, assuming you have the highest development of all nations who have royal marriages with your target. Other options include having the target fall under your PU outright if you're lucky, or having a secession war, where you will either defend or contest the PU. Any of these outcomes is a fantastic way to greatly increase your territory without accumulating excess aggressive expansion and triggering coalitions. Even if the target nation only obtains a noble from your dynasty, it's still possible to PU them. You can use the Claim Throne mechanic in the diplomatic interface to obtain a new Casus Belli against them, assuming they are of your dynasty and have either an heir with a weak claim or no heir at all. Once claimed, you can declare war on this nation to militarily force them to become your junior personal union partner, and this war only requires 77% war score, regardless of the size of your target. This means that if Muscovy or Russia have your dynasty, you can claim their throne and effectively vassalize them in one war, even if their empire is huge and larger than your own. Once you obtain a PU, they function almost identically to vassals, with a few notable exceptions. First, 
they do not pay you ducats each month like a vassal. Second, their liberty desire is often lower than other subject states, since their relative strength modifier is only in relation to you and not to your other subject states. Like other subjects, you can diplomatically integrate them with high enough relations, but unlike other subjects, you can inherit them to obtain all of their land for free. This is possible each time your ruler dies, and the chance for the inheritance depends on several factors and can be viewed on that nation's diplomatic screen. There are many other complicated mechanics linked to obtaining and abusing PUs, so let me know if you'd like a dedicated video on the subject in the comments below. If you ever find yourself strapped for ducats and wondering how to squeeze more out of your economy, you will find the following tips quite useful. Many players make the mistake of collecting trade in their home node and other nodes they possess territory in, which greatly limits the trading income you can make each month. By simply redirecting your merchants to steer trade to your capital, this money multiplies exponentially, as all trade sent to your capital's trade node is collected automatically, meaning that you don't have to waste a merchant to collect there. You should only send out merchants to collect trade in isolated downstream nodes you cannot otherwise take advantage of. But what exactly is a downstream and upstream trade node? In the interest of brevity, I will simplify the basics of trading mechanics. Trade in EU4 is broken down into trade nodes, which are trading areas you can collect or transfer from. As trade is abstracted in a linear sense in-game, it flows only in one direction, towards three European end nodes. These trade nodes are the English Channel, Venice, and Genoa, and are together the most valuable of all trade nodes as merchants cannot steer trade away from them. If you open the trade interface, you can see the flow of trade towards these nodes. Any node that has arrows pointing into it receives residual trade power from an upstream trade node, the trade node that directly precedes it. Likewise, all nodes except for the three end nodes have arrows pointing out of them, signifying that the trade is being sent to a downstream node. In order to maximize your trade income and make insane amounts of money, you must send out as many merchants as possible to direct upstream trade nodes to your capital or main trading port. As a reminder, you will always collect your trade automatically in the node of your capital or main trading port, a feature from the Wealth of Nations DLC that lets you collect in areas outside of your capital for 200 diplomatic monarch power points. But where should you place your merchants upstream to direct trade? The best place for your merchants are the trade nodes directly upstream for your capital, as these will likely have the largest trade value that you directly control. If we are playing Portugal or Castile, for example, our capital will be located in the Sevilla trade node. To maximize our trade income then, we must direct trade from the Ivory Coast first, and then direct trade from either Brazil or the Caribbean, if we have American colonies, or from the Cape of South Africa, if we are directing trade from India or Southeast Asia. Simply directing trade from your upstream nodes is worthless though if we don't control any provinces within the given node. It is for this reason that I highly recommend conquering all centers of trade and estuaries that are located within these upstream trade nodes. Centers of trade and estuaries provide massive trading bonuses, and controlling one or two of them with the appropriate buildings is often enough to monopolize the node and control the majority of trade. You can find these in the trading interface by locating the squares present on the map. Another tactic I highly recommend is to build light ships, which you can then use to protect trade in these upstream nodes. Every light ship that is protecting trade in the node will directly increase and multiply the amount you can steer out of the node and directly to your capital or main trading port, making them an essential investment if you want to dominate trade over sea. If you're interested in an in-depth look at trading in EU4, please let me know, and I will create a video dedicated to this topic. We haven't even approached the topics of inland trading, caravan power, or trade companies, but let's be honest. Trading is confusing enough as it is, and I don't want to derail the focus of this video, so let's move on to the next topic. The next tip we will cover is how to properly manage aggressive expansion. In the most basic terms, aggressive expansion, or AE, is designed to limit the player from conquering too much territory in too fast of a time. When AE is too high, coalitions will form which allows enemy AI nations to ally together against you, regardless of their religion, culture, or previous affiliations. But just because AE exists doesn't mean you cannot expand, and I will now explain several techniques you can use to manage it without having the entirety of the Holy Roman Empire descend upon you. Aggressive expansion is primarily based upon three things, proximity, religion, and diplomacy. Nations closer to your conquests will generate higher AE towards you, Likewise, conquering provinces that belong to another religious group will generate double the AE towards other nations within that religious group. On the other hand, forming alliances with nations and having subject states substantially lowers their AE impact towards you. By conquering wrong religion territory far away from your core provinces and maintaining a network of temporary and permanent alliances, you can effectively cut your aggressive expansion entirely. This allows you to blob while minimizing the amount of coalition wars that might band against you. 
Let's take an example. If an Ottomans player decides to invade and annex a Christian European nation, they will suffer severe AE penalties towards other Europeans, as they are a Sunni nation attacking a Christian country. If the Ottomans were to attack and annex the Mamluks or any other Islamic nation, however, the AE impact would be far lower towards European nations, who simply would not care that the Turks are conquering heathen territories far away from their homelands. Likewise, a European nation who expands into Islamic territory will certainly face high aggressive expansion penalties from other Middle Eastern nations, as they are a heretic expanding into the territory of their culture and religion. In order to reduce AE and the chances of coalitions forming then, you must be careful to balance your conquests in order to spread around your aggressive expansion. This can be done by alternating your wars into different religion provinces and invading nations that are incredibly far away. Attacking Native Americans as a European will have no impact on other European nations' opinion of you, for example example, and if you are expanding into multiple continents at the same time, you will be far less likely to trigger a coalition. But even with all of these mitigation strategies, coalitions might still form, so let's cover how to break them down once they've already appeared. There are several effective ways to destroy or survive a coalition. The first strategy we will now cover attempts to dismantle them peacefully. A nation can only form and maintain a coalition against you if its opinion of you is less than plus 50, and if its attitude towards you is outraged. This effectively means that you can use diplomacy to knock nations out of the coalition, by using your diplomats to improve relations with them, or by bribing them and influencing them until they reach plus 50 opinion. Once they reach this threshold, their opinion towards you will reset from outraged, and they will promptly leave the coalition, leaving it less powerful than it was before. This is especially effective against larger nations, as coalitions are based around comparative strength, and will often disband themselves if their more powerful members leave. The second peaceful way of disbanding a coalition is recruiting more soldiers and forming alliances with the strongest nations you can find. As stated earlier, this is because coalitions are based on the comparative strength between their side and yours, and by boosting your allied military potential, the coalition is more likely to disband entirely. Ultimately, when you are powerful enough and have conquered half of the world already, coalitions will stop forming since their competitive strength is far lower than your own. The third way we can disband a coalition is by abandoning our peaceful intentions and forcibly dismantling it through war. Any nation that has a truce with you cannot form a coalition against you, meaning that you can threaten war and demand provinces from nations to cut them out of the coalition entirely. Likewise, declaring wars against nations that are outraged and likely to join the coalition soon is also an effective method. You can quickly conquer these targets and piece them out with war reparations and humiliation, which will not affect your AE or cause other nations to join the coalition. The last way we can deal with coalitions is by using our alliances to our advantage when the coalition war inevitably triggers. Using this strategy, you can piece out the coalition quickly by offering up the provinces of your allies and releasing nations from within their territory. This requires that the coalition members have occupied allied territory, but it can be a fantastic way to escape relatively unscathed from the horde of enemies that seek to cut you in half. After you engage in this cowardly strategy and sell out your friends to avoid losing territory yourself, you will obtain a large truce against all of your coalition enemies, giving you many years to improve relations and bribe off the former members so that they do not attempt to go against you when the truce timer wears off. The next tip we will cover is useful for all nations, but absolutely critical for countries outside of Europe. I'm talking of course about institutions, a mechanic that spawns every 50 years and substantially penalizes the technological growth of nations that are geographically distant from their point of origin. Given that institutions almost always spawn in Europe, with the Renaissance guaranteed to spawn in Italy, colonialism likely to spawn in Spain or Britain, the printing press guaranteed to spawn in Germany, and so on and so forth, nations located in Africa, Asia, or the Americas are more or less forced to be technologically backwards and primitive. I mean, the game is called Europa Universalis for a reason, right? But it doesn't have to be that way. Once an institution spawns at its respective place of origin, it will slowly spread to neighbors if their relations are positive. But if you're playing in Asia and the Renaissance spawn in Italy, it might take hundreds of years before the institution reaches you, dooming you to a destiny of colonial exploitation as your technological level falls further and further behind. But if you save up about 2,000 monarch power across all three categories, you can forcibly spawn these institutions by developing one of your provinces. Before developing your province of choice, ensure that it doesn't have any disadvantageous modifiers, like mountains, glaciers, or rough terrain. It is ideal if you have a plains or grasslands province, as these do not have development penalties and are thus well suited for forcing institutions. While developing the province, you'll notice that the institution progress bar will go up, ultimately spawning the institution after it's reached 100%. 
This takes about 2000 Monarch power, which is a serious investment, but it's far better than the alternative 50% stacking technological modifier you have for not obtaining each institution. If you want to prevent your neighbors from benefiting from your institution, you can always rival them or set your relations manually to hostile. This is especially important for island nations like Malaya, that can shut down institution spread and remain technologically relevant while their neighbors are smacking stones like the Sintelese Islanders. By forcing institutions with development, you can compete with the Europeans at their own game, and colonize the world at your own pace. For our next tip, we will briefly cover the culture mechanic in order to demonstrate strategies you can use to get the maximum taxation, manpower, and production benefits out of every province you own. At the start of your campaign, only provinces with your primary culture and state religion will provide you maximum yields. Provinces belonging to your cultural group, but not your primary culture, give 15% less yields, while provinces belonging to a different cultural group entirely give 33% less yields, along with negative 2% missionary strength and plus 2 unrest modifiers. Consequently, foreign cultures will seriously decrease your economic and administrative performance, and should be either accepted or exterminated. If you opt to embrace the path of benevolence and positive karma, you can spend 100 diplomatic monarch power to accept one foreign culture, which will treat it as a primary culture and make it so that all provinces of that culture provide 100% resource yield. This is the easiest and fastest way to maximize the usefulness of your foreign provinces. You can also switch your primary culture to one of your accepted cultures, provided that you can pay 100 diplomatic monarch power, and given that the accepted culture has 50% or more of the development of your stated provinces. This allows you to form other nations and can be useful in many situations. The downside to tolerance, however, is that you can only promote a few accepted cultures at a time. So if you opt to go down the nice guy path, you should accept the largest and most developed foreign cultures, like French or English. Being nice and good isn't exactly historical, though. If you opt to embrace the path of pragmatism, you can approach culture in an entirely new way. Instead of accepting cultures, you can use culture conversion, which is a creative euphemism the developers have adopted for genocide and ethnic cleansing. Although cultural conversion costs diplomatic monarch power, which varies depending on factors like the development of said province or if you've completed religious ideas, it's great since it replaces those unwanted cultures with your primary culture. And since your primary culture confers no penalties, Culture conversion can be a great way to get the most out of your newly conquered provinces. Another fun way to spread your culture is to exterminate the indigenous people you colonize, as your soldiers can use the attack natives mechanic to replace the native population with that of your primary people and religion. Did you know that you can ignore events? Well, not entirely, but let me explain this next tip. When a random event pops up, your game will pause automatically for you to decide what option you'd like to take. If you press your spacebar though, you can unpause the game, and leave the event frozen for up to 6 months, before the first option is automatically chosen. This means that negative events that would normally spawn rebels in one of your province can be prepared for and dispatched with ease, as you can move your troops to the event province and trigger the event when you're ready for battle. This is not in and of itself game breaking, but can be incredibly useful, especially when event rebels want to spawn in your mountainous provinces and would be a pain to deal with normally. And, on the topic of rebels, it is likely that you will eventually conquer and annex regions that contain people and cultures that aren't receptive to your civilizing and benevolent influence. These rebels will stop at nothing to restore sovereignty to their nation, and will continuously revolt, given ample unrest and savory conditions in their provinces, like active missionaries are reducing their autonomy manually. The good news is that you can predict where they will appear, and make preparations to crush them instantly. This is because separatist troops always spawn in the highest development provinces of their culture. Like the aforementioned tip, this is crucial if the separatists are about to revolt at 80% rebellion progress and their provinces contain mountains or other disadvantageous terrain modifiers. If you cannot stop a rebellion from happening by placing soldiers on the province to reduce unrest, simply keep your soldiers on the highest development province that is experiencing unrest. Once the rebels pop up, they will be forced to attack you and not the other way around. Rebel whack-a-mole is rarely pleasant, but this tip can be helpful to maintain your manpower and crush the freedom fighters before they dance around your provinces and invoke more separatism. The last tip of our guide covers the second half of the campaign, also known as the age of nobody makes it this far before starting a new game. Jokes aside, if you play a campaign up to around 1610 and have the Mandate of Heaven DLC that unlocks the ages mechanic, you can benefit from absolutism. Whether you aim to conquer the world or just want to spread your chosen people and color across the map, absolutism is absolutely critical to expand quickly and efficiently. 
This is because maximum absolutism provides your nation plus 5% army discipline and plus 40% administrative efficiency. While the army discipline modifier is self-explanatory and explained more in depth in my military ideas guide video, administrative efficiency allows you to demand more provinces and peace deals and core said provinces far more cheaply. This means that if you want to greatly expand your nation, it's more practical to wait until the 17th century and the start of the age of absolutism. You can use the first 160 years of your campaign to invest in ideas, develop provinces, and engage in diplomacy while expanding slowly to preserve your monarch power. A common mistake that players make is to expand too quickly, leaving them without their idea trees filled and falling behind in technology, to say nothing about early game coalitions. But how do you increase absolutism to take advantage of this mechanic? Assuming you have the DLC, once the Age of Absolutism arrives, you should immediately decrease the autonomy of every stated province you own. The more developed the province is, the more absolutism you will gain. But be aware that rebels are likely to spawn, so prepare your troops accordingly. You can also increase absolutism by strengthening your government, which gives you plus 10 legitimacy and plus 2 absolutism at the cost of 100 military power, or harshly treating your rebellious provinces, which reduces their unrest by 30% and gives you plus 1 absolutism. On the other hand, you should avoid decreasing war exhaustion, increasing province autonomy, accepting rebel demands, or assigning seats in parliament, as these actions will decrease your absolutism. You can also boost your absolutism by unlocking the Absolute Government Splendor ability, which gives you one absolutism per year. For even more absolutism and enlightened despotism, you can opt to trigger the court and country disaster, arguably the only useful disaster in the game. To trigger it, you must own at least eight cities, not be a subject state, and have a stability of zero or lower and a national unrest of at least one. This is easily accomplished by declaring a war with no CB, which will tank your stability and provide war exhaustion which will easily catapult your national unrest and greatly lower your stability. With these prequisites out of the way, declare peace once disaster fires and take care of the rebels that spawn. Events will constantly fire that greatly increase your absolutism. And, after you've taken care of all the rebels, increased your stability to at least zero, and have waited at least 10 years, the event will end and you will gain a permanent plus 20 absolutism modifier that will last for the rest of your campaign. If you're interested in a more in-depth guide to any of the mechanics and tips outlined in the video, please let me know in the comment box below. Equally, if you're interested in more advanced strategies for experienced players, I'm going to release a second video to explain them in depth. Once it's released, it will be linked as a card in the top right of the screen, so be sure to check that out once it's available. If you're new to the channel, I also have dozens of guides and top 10 videos for EU4 and CK2 if you'd like to learn more. Please consider liking, commenting, or subscribing if you enjoyed this video, as this will really help the channel grow. We reached the end of the video, and I'd like to thank everyone for watching. A special shout out goes to my patrons on Patreon that support the channel on a regular basis. What EU4 videos would you like to see in the future? Let me know in the comment box below. I'm currently writing my thesis for my master's degree, so content will be paused for about a week and a half. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.